we got a full glass today. Guess what? This is Law & Order SVU season four, episode 22, Futility. We open up and there's a whole group of friends playing Texas Hold'em, having a great time with lots of poker lingo. All in, I raise you. I don't know shit about poker. Just then the intercom buzzes. The dude host goes over to check it and it's all breaking up. Now is that just me or did that sound like Finn? He can't hear shit so he goes down to check. It must be the food we ordered. Gets to the front door, looks left and right, and then notices the bag of food. It's literally the first thing you would see. Like a neon sign of delivery food. And just as he's picking it up, boom! It's the whole SVU team putting him in handcuffs. I knew it was Finn! Whatever you're arresting me for, you've got the wrong guy! Benson says, it's rape, Mr. Gardner. What? And then punches Benson in the mouth. His wife's coming down like, what are you doing? Call my lawyer, I already have a lawyer. Ooh, hell of an opener. But now we've got Mr. Gardner in an interrogation room. His lawyer's there and her hair has the most incredible flip. She's pretty pissed. Um, how did my client get hurt between when he got arrested and here? Everybody looks over at Finn who's just leaning casually against the wall. He fell. Uh-huh. Okay, so why did they bring him in? Well, they found a fingerprint on a metal railing two blocks away from where he lives. It matched a bar fight that he got into in college. That's why he was booked. And the reason they were looking for fingerprints is because there was a rape victim. Mr. Eyebrows Gardner is like, I walk my dog all over the place. I could have fingerprints everywhere. And flippy lawyers like, uh, yeah. Fingerprints does not equal four rapes. Well, just hold on. We've got pictures and there's a pattern. He chokes them till they pass out, rapes them, and then he cuts them on the breast. And that last victim, she was only pretending to be unconscious when he cut her. She was able to give up a description. Not only that, but this bitch is ready to pick him out of a lineup. Cut to this victim. And she also has a flippy haircut. She's also getting cold feet. She's with Bethany Taylor, the rape counselor. And this bitch is good at her job. She's not leaving her side. What if I pick the wrong guy? Benson's got a worker bedside manner a little bit. Couple minutes later, voila, she's ready to go. Pull back the curtain and there's five dudes. They all look about the same wearing hideous sweaters and khaki ass pants. Mike Gardner's holding up number three and just shifty eyeing all over the place. Very nonchalant. <sighs> it's number three. He's the man who raped me. Well, that was easy. Benson heads in with all four victims. Okay, the good news is the suspect is being booked now. All four of you will have to go before the grand jury, but don't worry, he won't be there. Later, when it goes to trial, then you'll have to testify again and he will be there. Here's the bad news. He's probably gonna get the fuck out on bail and he knows where some of them live. So the deal is they can take out a personal protection order against him. But in that case, they have to give up the address of their home and work because he has to know where he can't go. None of them like it, but they all agree. All right, it's probably in our best interest. The whole team's back at the precinct and they're trying to find the link between the four victims. Just then Benson gets a phone call. Whoa, 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 slow down. Don't, don't approach him, just hang on. That was one of the victims. Gardner's in the coffee shop that she's in. Holy shit! So Benson and Stabler bust down to nice Perks coffee shop. Where is he? Oh, he left. Well, what happened? Well, I walked in and he smiled and said, hello. So he was there before you walked in. Okay, clearly that's not quite enough. His lawyer's gonna argue that it was a total coincidence. And maybe it was. Dr. Huang is lurking in the background. I doubt it's a coincidence. Oh, really? He strikes me as a power reassurance rapist. That doesn't sound like a good kind. He rapes women to get power and then cuts them to mark them for life. Well, shit, can we move them to a safe house or like give them a detail? No, there's no money for that. Great. So we're just gonna have to let them know to be careful. And with that message, Benson and Stabler have to head to one of the victims' home. Yeah, uh, just make sure to keep your eye out because there's shit we can do. Obviously, she's so pissed because that's not great protection. Look, I know it's hard. You know nothing. Slam. Benson and Stabler turn around. Son of a bitch! There's Gardner walking the fucking cutest puppy I've ever seen. Dude, are you kidding me? You're under arrest. What? What are you talking about? I'm walking my cute ass puppy. You violated a personal protection order. You're going to Rikers. Benson leads him away and then Stabler's just looking at this cute puppy like, 
what the fuck am I supposed to do with this? Do I have a dog now? So we jump to the hearing, but not the rape hearing, the PPO violation hearing. Judge looks up. I'm sorry, where is your counsel? Your honor, I'm representing myself. Oh, like a narcissist, very normal. Oh goody, and how does the defendant bleed? Not guilty, your honor. Cabot's there and she's like, uh, your honor, he was at a coffee shop with one victim and then across from another victim's home. I was getting coffee and I was walking my dog. I didn't even have contact with the second victim. Well, shit, judge agrees. I'm Dismissing all charges is insufficient. And uh-oh, what's this? Garner's defending himself in the rape trials too. What does it mean? He gets to cross-examine his alleged victims. What the fuck? Benson is pissed. Garner didn't attack Karen Latham by her home. Karen Latham is the one that he showed up across her place. He didn't get her address until we filed the PPO. Basically handed him a fucking map. Next time we should just drive him over. And guess what? Somebody shows up at the precinct. Alexandra Cabot? Yes, that's me. Boom, you got served. With a motion to sever the charges. Do you know what this fucking means? When Gardner wins it the next day, all four rape cases can't be tried together. And because they only have the eyewitness identifying him for the fourth rape, the judge decides there isn't enough evidence for the first three. God damn it. So now we're just down to the fourth victim. Her name is Carrie Hewitt. She's the one with flippy hair that identified him. He's the only one that's going to trial and her rapist is going to be questioning her. Obviously, she doesn't want to do it. Benson swoops in again. In all my years, I've never known a single rape victim to regret testifying, but I've known plenty who've regretted not testifying. And then it's too late. Uh, fine. We jump to the trial. Cabot's just finishing up with Miss Hewitt. And now it's Gardner's turn. By the way, he still has his little flippy haired lawyer sitting by him just to monitor the counsel. Miss Hewitt, uh, you said your attacker choked you? Yes, you put a cord around my neck. I see, and uh, you said that your attacker sexually assaulted you? Yes, you forced your penis into my vagina. Right, it's like this weird back and forth where he's like, your attacker, and she's like, fucker, you. He tries to ask about Bethany Taylor, the rape counselor, and what the fuck they talked about. But that shit's privilege. So when Cabot's like, objection, judge sustains. Where the fuck is he going with this? But then, as soon as Benson gets on the stand, we know where the fuck he's going with this. He starts trying to insinuate that Benson told Bethany Taylor, the rape counselor, that it was him to try and get the victim to identify him. On recess, Cabot and Benson are pissed at each other. You should have told me about this. That lineup was not tainted. Well, it's still bad even if it looks like it was tainted. Just then, Bethany Taylor, the rape counselor, marches in. She's not happy because she just got a subpoena to testify for Michael Gardner. Now we're really outraged. We go screaming to the judge. Your honor, in no way should this be allowed. Okay, hang on. I will interview Bethany Taylor, the rape counselor, in my chambers one-on-one. -on -one. Based on what she discloses, I will decide if she will testify. But guess who's not standing for this shit? Bethany Taylor, the rape counselor. She says, uh-uh. It's confidential for a fucking reason. And therefore chooses to be held in contempt and thrown in fucking jail. It's pretty badass. Cabot and Benson head in and talk to Bethany Taylor, the rape counselor. Judge Preston said you will have to testify, so. I absolutely will not. Just tell Judge Preston what you talked about and she'll know it's immaterial. It's fine. But then the goddamn precedent will be set. So what? You're just going to wait it out? I brought my damn toothbrush. Yeah, I like this bitch. What are we supposed to do? He's going to walk. You're supposed to help the victim. Do your job. We jump to the apartment of Carrie Hewitt, the rape victim who identified Gardner. She's not doing great. Broke up with her fiance. She only sleeps 20 minutes a night. She's too afraid to go outside. Sometimes, you know, I wish he would just have killed me. Benson zooms into the camera. You're our last hope, man. What they ask her to do is waive her rights to confidentiality. That way, Bethany Taylor, the rape counselor, can tell Judge Preston what she said without breaking her confidence. I mean, I guess. We jump ahead to when court is back in session and the judge is ruling on Bethany Taylor, the rape counselor's testimony. None of what she said is relevant to pretrial identification. Therefore, it will not be entered into the record. Garner sweat his dick off. Objection. Excuse me? That's not fair. That's my fucking ruling. And I'm the fucking judge. We're dismissed for today. Walking out of the courtroom, Bethany Taylor, the rape counselor, 
comes up with some bad news. I hope you're happy. Look what you've done. She's got a subpoena from one of her other clients' perpetrators asking to disclose information. And six other of her clients have refused her counsel. Oh yeah, it's wide reaching. It sucks balls. Benson's feeling really bad. Where do you go when you're feeling really bad? Your best friend's house. But Benson's married to the job. So where does she go? She goes to Stabler's house. Pulls up in his little car with a bag of fucking groceries. Where's Kathy and the kids? They went to La Boheme. <laughs> Hard pass. So the one night you get to be with your wife and kids, you decide to stay home. Great job. He sits down next to her and she's just lamenting. Maybe it's not worth putting one dude away at the expense of so many. Stabler's like, you identify with the victim all the time. Probably because you're a woman. But uh, but that makes you a great cop. So what the hell's the point? There's always another child molester. Always another rapist. Shit, we got a front row seat to Benson's existential crisis here. Stabler's not big on emotion. He's trying really hard. Maybe there isn't a point. Nobody's making you do this. Uh, no. Swing and a miss. Next day at trial, Benson and Stapler walk in to realize <gasps> Gardner never showed up. And before the door swings closed, they're plowing back out to find him. <sighs> He's probably making a break for it. He also could be still in the area, so we need to let everybody who could be a victim know. Stapler gets a phone call. Too late. We've got another victim. And this time... She's dead. Jump to the morgue and Emmy Warner's going through all the details. Victim was Evelyn Sharp of Staten Island. Evidence shows manual strangulation, but he used latex gloves this time, so this fucker's learning. Her hands have defensive wounds and bruises on her knuckles. Emmy Warner's like, one more thing. Look the fuck at this. There's a big chunk of skin that's missing from her wrist. Oh, he must have bitten her and then carved out the bite mark. This guy's becoming a regular criminal genius. Not quite. He didn't go deep enough. Because there's still imprints on the muscle tissue. Oh shit, can you match it to Gardner's dental records? I already did. Ooh, it lines up perfectly. We got the son of a bitch. Now let's find him. We ask flippy hair lawyer. They're showing her the proof. If I knew, I would tell you. His wife doesn't know. His family doesn't know. Benson walks in with a big old fat folder of all of his financial record. Most recently, he took out five grand from this ATM at the Bronx. To the Bronx! We asked the guy who's working there and he's like, oh yeah, that picture? Review the tapes. We see Gardner getting into a car. The passengers, who the fuck is driving? Enhance. Enhance the driver. He's making out with her. That's right. Gardner's got himself a little girlfriend. They still don't know who it is, so they're checking the phone records. Looks like this guy was smart enough not to be calling his girlfriend. But the majority of his calls were to his lawyer. Huh, last month too. What's this? Four months ago, before he was arrested? That's right. Flippy hair lawyer is the girlfriend. By the way, she does have a name. It's Aaron Russ. We're knocking on the door. Hey, flippy hair Russ lawyer, it's us, the cops. We hear... The door is open. Bust in. Where is he? Where's my- He's here. We see her sitting on the sofa and just the back of her head with like a full wave of hair flip. Put your hands where we can see them. Slowly raises them and they're covered in blood. Camera pans down and there he is dead on the floor. Holy shit, are, are you hurt? He denied it after I had found everything. Okay, well if he attacked you, there's nothing you could have done. Right. Justifiable homicide. If- he attacked me. Okay. And for our last scene, somebody pulled some strings to get victim Carrie Hewitt into that autopsy room. She wants some closure. They pull down the sheet. Carrie stares down defiantly. And if I was writing this episode, I'd be like, take that, you little motherfucker. Calm a little bitch. She just cocks her head and turns around to leave. Screen goes black. Dick Wolf. And that was Law & Order SVU Season 4, Episode 22. Jum jum. <laughs>